Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to our 24th program of 2014. Yes, 24th. In addition to this program, we still right now have another 14 programs to go. And how do you know about these programs or where they're located? On the website, on the right side of the page, it says upcoming events. And if you have a computer or from your cell phones or wherever, you can just go to the page and scroll down and see what programs are taking place and where they might be. You may know somebody in another city where these are taking place, and you may want to inform them in advance of where they can you know, go to watch one of these programs. We've extended, we've expanded our operation now to where, where we are outside the state of Florida. We are now in Alabama, Georgia, and North Carolina as well. And coming up in September, October, and November, we just got a grant to do four programs in those areas. So we are expanding. We have people on the ground that are already going around building the databases and getting it going. So that way we can bring these Florida programs to those areas as well. And eventually we'll get out of those states and move a little bit further north. So enough about that too. For tonight's program, let's just get into this now because you all have been waiting long enough. First off, for anybody that's not, that is wearing one of these or wanted to be gluten-free and already told us about it, you needed to get this from our registration desk outside, you'd have to go out there and get it from her. Or a green band, for anybody that registered with us that you're a vegetarian, you're gonna need to get that. Did you get yours? That's good, okay. The doctor has to be checked on also. All right, for tonight, like all of our programs, we must thank those that give us the grants to do these programs. We rely on the pharmaceutical industry, and the pharmaceutical relies on us to be able to provide these kinds of programs, educating the MS patients. That is exactly what we want to do and will continue to do. So for tonight's program, I, and I hope all of you, will thank Genzyme, a Sanofi company, for providing tonight's grant. Genzyme is the maker of Abagio, and I do want to thank them. In addition to Genzyme, we have Accorda Therapeutics, who makes Ampira. That's the walking pill, for those that don't know. Biogen IDEC, who has Avinex, Tysabri, and Tecfidera. Questcore Pharmaceuticals, who makes Akthar. You'll hear about these drugs and whatnot from the doctor speaking after as well. Infinity Clinical Research is here, and they do a lot of research programs here in Broward County, and we hope that you, if you're not using a medicine, do contact them and see what they've got cooking so that way you can try something. Also, we have Teva Neuroscience. Teva makes Copaxone. So again, I want to thank all these sponsors, and I hope you all do too, because again, without them, we cannot do these programs. Moving things along, we have our format for tonight. We have Dr. Steingo, who's going to speak first. I'm sure most of you in this room know about Brian Steingo, and if you haven't, then you're in for a great program, first with Dr. Steingo, and then, of course, with Dr. Matt Kay. And Dr. Steingo will be speaking about the invisible symptoms of multiple sclerosis, as well as treatment options and a few other things. And then Dr. Matt Kay will be along to speak after we do a Q&A with Dr. Steingo. Then Dr. Kay will speak about how vision is affected by multiple sclerosis. And after he speaks, we'll do another Q&A. So I hope that you're all in for a great night. Oh, and by the way, if you have something to say to a waiter, if they're missing something, just raise your hand. Don't shout out, hey, you, all right? This is not New York. We, don't, we can't say forget about it afterwards. OK? Thank you. OK, well, remember, I'm a New Yorker. I get to say these things. All right, let's get started. Okay, so next up, how many of you know how to say neuro-ophthalmologist? Ophthalmologist. It's not O-T-H, it's O-P-T-H-8, whatever, T-H, da-da-da. Well, that's what we have coming up next. And Dr. K has spoken for us in the past, and you can see it on, I believe, one of the uh, previous programs was video recorded as well. So if you miss anything tonight, you can go back and find where he spoke on our, in our archives, and um, otherwise just pay attention, and I hope you have lots of questions. When I'm on that side of the room, ask, ask them. <laughs> okay, um, well I'm Matt Kay, some of you know me, some of you heard me lecture before, some of you have seen me as a patient. Let me start my timer because Stu gave me 35 minutes. I don't want to over 
stay my welcome. Um, I do, in case uh, any of you have seen me in my Boca Raton office, have one announcement. That office uh, closed down about three, four weeks ago, so I'm now in Fort Lauderdale, but if you have my card and you call my West Palm office, we can give you the information for the new address. It's in North Lauderdale around Pompano, just south of Pompano. All right, well, um, tonight I want to talk about the neuro-ophthalmology of MS, and I must say Dr. Steingo's leaving now, but uh, one of the things that I've so enjoyed about my practice in terms of MS is having the opportunity to share so many patients with Brian. He's a great resource for all of you and a great resource for me in terms of uh, being able to have my patients taken care of with just superb expertise. Um, all right, tonight we'll talk about the neuro-ophthalmology of MS and why it's important to many of you in the room. Well, neuro-ophthalmology, which I can pronounce, and it's just two words together, but uh, it's the subspecialty of both neurology and ophthalmology, which addresses neurologic conditions, which affect vision and eye movement. Um, there was just a question about um, myelination. Uh, the optic nerves are certainly uh, myelinated, and so demyelination tends to have a predilection for the optic nerves. In terms of the peripheral nerves that move the eyes, the third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve, um, I don't really know whether they are myelinated uh, once they leave the brainstem, and I would think not, but um, uh, certainly within the brainstem itself, there can be uh, demyelinating lesions affecting the eye movements. Um, all right, so multiple sclerosis is an inflammatory uh, target uh, there's against the myelin around the optic nerves, as many of you know, but as we'll talk about later, it also affects the nerve cells themselves, so it's an axonal disease, which are the nerve fibers that are covered by the myelin, not just a demyelinating disease. It's a female predominance, age between 20 and 50, looking around the room, uh, you can uh, tell that or know yourselves if that's the age of onset, um, Caucasian predominance. And what's very important in terms of neuro-ophthalmology is that about 50% of patients will present with neuro uh, features. How many people in the room here are presented with either optic neuritis, double vision, or jumping of the eyes and those hands go up? And uh, uh, there's some people, even if it wasn't their first symptom, maybe they had some numbness uh, five years before they lost vision. Somebody thought they uh, pulled a muscle, pinched a nerve, what have you. And it's not until they lose vision that even though it's not really their first symptom, it's the first thing that really brings to light the diagnosis of MS. So I see a lot of people right off the bat. And when Brian before was talking about a clinically isolated syndrome, that is your first episode of a demyelinating event where you get an MRI, you have multiple white matter plaques, you have this, uh, the plaques being consistent with MS, and so that's clinically isolated syndrome, and that's a lot of what I see to start off with, and then I call up the neurologist, most often if you're anywhere in the South Florida area, I'm sending you to uh, Dr. Steingo if the insurance plan allows for it for the uh, workup, and uh, I use other neurologists as well, but I just think Brian's superb. Um, and somewhere during the course of the disease, about 70% of people will ultimately have some demyelinating effect affecting the visual pathways. Not everybody with visual deficits who, has M who have MS have their MS being the responsible cause, so there are other things that can occur as well. Um, and uh, we can talk about that. All right, so the four questions that I'm always curious when I have an MS patient coming into me are, is your vision blurred? Do you have loss of vision? Do you have double vision or pieces of the world missing because you have a visual field defect from a lesion affecting the visual pathways um, further posterior, or further back in the brain? Or is the world jumping? Do you have the world jumping up and down or side by side from people who have nystagmus? Um, so, certainly optic neuritis by far and away is the most common symptom that will present to me related to MS. Double vision probably next, and there's a specific pattern in the double vision, uh, although we can see people with nerve palsies like a sixth nerve palsy or a fourth nerve palsy, a third nerve palsy, those are nerves that move the eyes. The most common is a, something called an internuclear ophthalmoplegia or an INO. There's a strong predilection for involving those nerve pathways in the brainstem. 
Um, and that can be a first symptom of MS as well, or occur uh, as a secondary event. Um, other problems are nystagmus, which is jumping of the eyes, and list some other things here. Visual field defects, that would be from inflammatory lesions further back in the brain, um, affecting not your ability to see in terms of your ability to read the eye chart, but taking away a piece of your visual field and usually uh, uh, affecting both eyes to some degree. Um, and then there's Uthoff's phenomenon. Um, that's a symptom where you have blurred vision after being exposed to heat or exercise. That is from demyelination of the optic nerves. So a patient with uh, MS goes to the gym, they're working out, um, and then they find their vision gets blurry when they cool down again, maybe uh, put an ice pack on or go in air conditioning. If they've been outside in the heat, vision gets back. Very common. Anybody here have Utoff symptom? I'd imagine there'd be a bunch of people with it. Not too many, actually. Some. Okay. And um, in terms of optic nerve disease, well, as a neuro-ophthalmologist, my uh, practice is probably 50% 50 spent on people with optic nerve conditions, and the other half dealing with people who have uh, double vision. Uh, optic neuritis, by far and away, is the most common cause of um, optic nerve damage in the young. So it is certainly in the most common visual symptom of MS, and in fact, optic neuritis is probably the most common isolated symptom of MS in general, so not the uh, most common neuroophthalmologic problem, but probably the most common individual um, disorder that anybody with MS can have. About 25% of patients will present with optic neuritis, and 50% will have evidence at some time during the course of their disease. There's even people who we see who've had MS for 15, 20, and 25 years who've never had an acute episode of optic neuritis, but when we look at the optic nerves, we see the optic nerves are pale, there's some loss of the nerve fibers, and that's just from some chronic demyelination of the nerves in spite of the absence of an acute event. Um, and there's ways to even show more subtle damage to the optic nerve um, beyond uh, just an acute episode of optic neuritis. We can do visual evoke potentials, or nowadays we do uh, nerve fiber layer analysis, which I'll talk about in a while. So uh, optic neuritis is the most common optic nerve disorder between the ages of 18 and 40. It's a broad prevalence, depending on who you read, but probably somewhere around 50 to 100 people out of 100,000. About three quarters are women, and the mean age at onset is 32. And um, in terms of the features, it's the acute onset of unilateral visual loss. It's associated with pain on eye movement in the vast majority of cases, greater than 90% in the optic neuritis treatment trial. Um, in about two-thirds of the cases, it's inflammation behind the eye, uh, what we call retrobulbar, and in about a third of the cases, the actual optic nerve will appear swollen. Um, and when people present to us with optic neuritis, the first thing I do is I grab an MRI because I know that that means the eventual development of uh, multiple sclerosis in a significant percentage of patients. Um, and it's a, MRI is the greatest predictor of who will go on to develop MS. And there was a question about lumbar punctures before. Um, my approach is very similar to Dr. Steingo's. It's very uncommon that I would have to suggest a lumbar puncture in a patient who presented to me with optic neuritis. Um, I know there are neurologists who do get them, even with classic lesions on the MRI brain. If you have optic neuritis and multiple white matter lesions on the brain, there is absolutely no reason to recommend a lumbar puncture unless something is really atypical about that optic neuritis. You've already got your diagnosis of optic neuritis and you have your predictive value in terms of the MRI, in terms of risk of developing MS that Brian talked about before, in terms of the number of lesions that you have and the risk of MS after 20 years. Um, where lumbar puncture can be helpful is in the unusual circumstance where a patient has an episode of classic optic neuritis and the MRI is totally normal. You can then use a lumbar puncture to determine which group of those normal MRIs, which individuals within those no that normal MRI group will have a higher risk of developing MS down the line, and that came out of the optic neuritis treatment trial as well. But you can also get MRIs of the spinal cord and see if there's evidence for demyelination that would steer you towards a, a diagnosis of MS. And um, this is uh, 
an MRI of a person with optic neuritis, and if you can tell at all, this optic nerve on the left is a lot brighter than the one over here, um, which is more gray, and that shows the optic nerve inflammation. And the classic symptom is this central scotoma, or this central blind spot. Um, and this would be a... Uh, image of somebody with a central scotoma will have kind of just a blurred out central area they might see peripherally. You can have your entire vision knocked out by optic neuritis, but a lot of times it's just a central uh, vision. It can either be a white out of vision like that, or it could be actually a denser gray or black out of vision. Um, so a normal optic nerve is shown here. It's kind of this little disc. It sticks into the back of the eye. It has these blood vessels coming out in the retina. And here's an optic nerve that's swollen. This is from the our neuro-ophthalmology website. Um, and the nerve is just the edges are indistinct. They're blurred. It's a little elevated. So this is an abnormal nerve that's fuzzy around the edges or swollen. And here's a normal optic nerve. Um, an example of an MRI of a more impressively enhancing optic nerve. This is diffusely white here, um, whereas the optic nerve in the other eye is gray or a normal color that we'd see on MRI. Um, so what's the prognosis after an episode of optic neuritis? Well, if I sat there and I told the patient who came in the room, you've got optic neuritis, greater than 90% chance you're going to be better than 20, 40 or better in a few months. This is great news. People are all happy. But the problem is it does have a high incidence of progression to MS down the line always. I don't have this discussion. The first time I see them usually, unless they come in with uh, all the literature because somebody else told them they had optic neuritis and they're asking questions because what do I really want to know? I want to know what the MRI showed because the MRI is going to be so important in determining what kind of conversation I have with them in terms of what type of uh, treatment is going to be initiated or not necessary. So although greater than 90% of people will get back to at least 20, 40 vision, um, there can be residual damage. You can have contrast sensitivity. Colors can still seem washed out. You can still have pupillary abnormalities. And OCT, which uh, it allows us to actually measure the thickness of the nerve fiber layer in the retina that goes on to form the optic nerve, um, we can even see there's thinning there after an episode of optic neuritis. Um, as a matter of fact, we virtually always do. Um, after recovery from optic neuritis, you can still have blurred vision when you get exposed to heat or exercise because your body heat goes up. Um, that always returns to normal once your body cools back down. One thing I, I do feel it's really important to mention, um, the use of oral prednisone alone, so prednisone by mouth or medrol dose pack for an acute episode of optic neuritis has clearly been shown from the optic neuritis treatment trial to increase the recurrence of episodes of optic neuritis. I still see some neurologists so sitting there saying, oh, it's an optic neuritis here, take some pills by mouth instead of three days of IV steroids. You need to tell your neurologist, if any of you have somebody recommending that, that that is not appropriate treatment in this day and age or for pretty much the last 20 years. But it's slow to disseminate, uh, even though that information's been around for about 15, 20 years, 20, I guess, um, to all neurologists. Um, IV steroids, on the other hand, do accelerate visual recovery. But um, if you look at people a year after their acute episode of optic neuritis, a group treated with IV steroids and a group that was not treated, um, the visual outcome's the same. As a matter of fact, it's pretty much the same by six months, except for the group of people who had really poor vision to begin with. Um, they take a little longer to catch up. Um, now, you can use oral prednisone after your three days or five days of IV steroids, but it should not be used as a sole treatment. All right, so um, uh, Dr. Stango showed uh, information in a bar graph uh, similar to this slide. He gave the 20-year follow-up data. I guess I should update my slide. But um, if you have an episode of optic neuritis and you present to me or any other ophthalmologist or neuro-ophthalmologist, and you go get an MRI scan of the brain, if you have greater than five lesions on your MRI of brain at presentation with an episode of optic neuritis, you've got about a 75% chance of developing MS at 15 years. And what Dr. Stango showed, it was more like 80% by 20. Um, <clears throat> just a single plaque 
on your MRI, just one little white matter lesion um, gives you about a 56% chance of developing MS by 15 years. And Dr. Steingo grouped together the people, I think, with one to three plaques, and that was up to 80% at 20. And, um, and if you have zero plaques on your brain, that was about the same as what he presented. Um, just about a quarter of people, a little less than a quarter, will have MS. So even a normal MRI at presentation with optic neuritis, you still have a, about a 25% 15-year risk. And those are the people then who had the normal MRI. You can maybe identify them earlier on by doing a spinal tap in those cases, a lumbar puncture. Um, certainly, these studies came from the optic neuritis, or these data came from the optic neuritis treatment trial. I think the information that Dr. Steingo presented may have come from the Mayo Clinic. Um, those studies were all started before we had the immunomodulating agents available. It doesn't seem all that long ago, but uh, um, these things, as uh, Dr. Steingo said on his slide, if uh, he put up his slide of all the drug therapies in April of 1993 or whatever it was, it would be a blank slide. There were no approved medications. And so um, we certainly think that the immunomodulating agents may be altering the natural history we're presenting up here. Um, so after an episode of optic neuritis, uh, if here's your normal optic nerve, again, the optic nerve loses its healthy orangish, or what we call a pink color, but the orange color turns yellow or whitish, pale, and that's a typical appearance. But we can see this. Just in long-standing MS, people can get a pale optic nerve without an acute episode of optic neuritis, just from generalized demyelination of the nervous system. Um, other symptoms, the next thing would be uh, double vision, most common thing other than optic neuritis presenting to me with an INO that I'll show you a picture of in a second. And the other cranial nerves, m much less uh, frequently involved, finally can have nystagmus, which is this um, jumping of the eyes up and down in a rhythmic fashion. And uh, you can have field loss related to involving the visual pathways in the brain. I'll show some examples. So this is an example of an INO, another classic uh, eye movement disorder in MS. Here's somebody looking straight ahead. The two eyes are lined up. When they look over to the right, the left eye doesn't come in. When they look to the left, the eyes go out fine. So um, that somebody who has an internuclear ophthalmoplegia on their left eye, so they can't move the eye inwards. And it doesn't have to be as dramatic as this. If the eyes are just at all out of alignment, the eye might get 90% of the way over, and the other one gets 100% over. And if the eyes aren't looking in the same place, they'll be off. It doesn't have to be spread so far apart. So any misalignment in the eyes will lead to double vision. Yes, go ahead. Oh, you were calling for the waiter, okay. <laughs> I could bring you over tea, coffee, whatever. Um, all right, now we can see things that mimic an INO. Um, so myasthenia is a classic disease that can give you a pseudo-INO, where you th it looks like, a, oops, an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, let me see. Here it is. Um, so here's somebody, opposite side, his left eye goes out, his right eye doesn't go in, looks like an INO, but this person ended up having myasthenia gravis. But when you see a true INO, you see it in a young patient, it's virtually always an MS. You see it in people who are 60 and older, it's virtually always a stroke to the back area of the brain. But in that gray area of 45 to 55, that's where either one can present. Um, all right, so you can also get nerve palsies uh, that cause double vision as well. Um, a six nerve palsy is the most common, and this is the opposite problem. So here, the eye goes all the way in, but the other eye doesn't go all the way out. So when this patient's looking off to their left, they're seeing two images side by side. And uh, they don't have to be drunk to be seeing double, and they have this kind of problem. So there's a, that's what it would look like to them. Um, Many people in the room have double vision at some point or all the time from their disease? Not too many, okay. Oh, a couple of hands. Yep, some more floating up. So the way to uh, treat double vision, well, you can ignore it, but sometimes that's hard to do if you're looking at things and everything you see is double. Some people, though, the eye gets to be so far shifted to this side that you're able to ignore that second image. Um, but a lot of times it's very disturbing, so your choices are to look like the Hathaway man and Patch and I. 
Um, if it's an acute episode, like an INO or a nerve palsy, they often get better, just like optic neuritis and other symptoms get better in an acute uh, event if you have relapsing or remitting disease. So we just will patch uh, temporarily until the double vision clears up. If it's more of a chronic problem, we can use prism glasses. Here's an example of a Fresnel prism that they're cutting out to put on a glass. Um, or you can do muscle surgery in some circumstances as well. Just like kids with crossed eyes, you can do adults uh, who have uh, eyes that aren't lined up either. Um, nystagmus is this to and fro oscillating movement. The eyes very disabling to patients. Their entire world is jumping back and forth, and uh, that's called oscillopsia, and it's from nystagmus. Um, when you have problems with the visual pathways further back in the brain, um, you, you can get what we call homonymous field defects. So if uh, you have a lesion in the occipital lobe or the radiations going back to the occipital lobe, the visual radiations, if you have a lesion on the right side of your brain, you will affect the left half of your vision, not in one eye, but the left half of each eye because the optic nerves cross together at a place called the optic chiasm and everything, any lesion behind that area will affect half the vision in each eye. So a right side lesion affects the left half of each eye and a left sided lesion will affect the right half of each eye, not just the right eye. And that's how somebody would see if they had a hemianopia, they'd have part of their field blacked out. Now that's a black and white case, but there can be any degree of that. You can have a mild hemianopia. Um, again, here would be somebody's visual environment if they had the full picture and if they had a lesion on the left side of their uh, visual pathways behind the optic chiasm, they would miss the right half of whatever they were looking at. Everything you see is clear, but you're only seeing half of it, so you can be 20-20 in each eye, but you're missing half your world, and that's very disabling too. As a matter of fact, you can drive a car, if one eye's blind, totally blind, but you have both eyes open, you will see your whole picture. You have a hemianopia, each eye can be 20-20, but you're missing half your world. You don't see a car coming until it's right halfway in front of your uh, hood of your car. You don't see a kid walking from the side of the street until they're halfway in front of your car. So that's a far more disabling type of field defect for a lot of functioning in spite of the fact that you're 20-20 in each eye. Um, I wanted to put this slide up on Jelenia. Um, anybody in the room on Jelenia? Okay. And, um, all right, so um, not too many, but um, Jelenia has been associated with swelling of the retina, an area of the retina called the macula, and it's not very common. I've had only one patient who's had macular edema from Jelenia, and um, it's about a one out of 500 incidents with the dosage that was approved by the FDA. Um, if you don't know, Jelenia is a, was the first oral uh, MS agent that was approved, and Dr. Steiner mentioned it. There's three on the market now. Um, and um, macular edema is something that isn't just isolated to Jelenia. We see that in many disorders, and certainly we see it in people who have inflammation in the eye, what we call uveitis, or, and diabetics can get macular edema. So this one out of 500 risk is a greater frequency if you already have these predisposing conditions. Um, generally, if the macular edema or the swelling in the central retina occurs, um, it's within four months of initiation of treatment. This has nothing to do with macular degeneration, which is the most common cause of a, a macular pathology. This is another macular condition. So our recommendations are to see somebody as a baseline exam, make sure they don't have any underlying macular pathology that would preclude the use of Jelenia, see them about three to four months after initiating treatment, and then about six months after that, then once a year or sooner if the patients have uh, any uh, visual complaints. And those visual complaints would generally be blurred vision because it's right in the center, um, or distortion where straight lines seem a little uh, bent or uh, skewed, so uh, there's just a central distortion. Uh, it so happens one case that I saw um, had um, uh, intact vision because the swelling was just as centric, just to the side of the central macula, so had he not come in for his routine uh, follow-up, I wouldn't have picked that up. And uh, it can affect both eyes in about a quarter of the patients. 
Right. Um, OCT, um, if uh, people visited their ophthalmologists over recent years, this optical coherence tomography is very commonly employed. Now it's a way for us to directly measure the thickness of the nerve fiber layer. It's the only nerve in the body, the optic nerve, that we can directly visualize. So when I showed you those pictures of the optic nerve before inserting in the back of the eye, any of the nerves anywhere else in our body, the cranial nerves, the nerves which control the arms, legs, sensation, mo uh, motor, um, are not visible to our eye, but the optic nerve we can directly see. And with an OCT, not only can we now look at it, we can actually, instead of me just telling you the nerve is pale, I can actually measure the thickness of it with this device. And um, the um, OCT is now becoming part of a protocol um, in many, many of the drug trials that are going on for uh, new MS drugs where you go to the ophthalmologist and we do baseline OCTs and we follow it during the course of disease um, because it may be showing us that people who have progressive thinning, and this is information we're still trying to understand and uh, grasp, but it may be that if a drug A shows less thinning over three years in somebody who's on a placebo that maybe this drug is having a neuroprotective effect. Maybe we can infer from changes in the optic nerve what's going on in the remainder of the nervous system. And these are the little printouts we get. Um, here's somebody with optic atrophy. I should have probably showed a normal one too. So the this black line here, if you can see this, should be all up in the green zone. That would be a normal thickness. And there's a range of normal from down here towards the yellow to up to top here, um, but this red zone is clearly thin, um, and uh, so here's somebody with uh, bilateral optic atrophy or thinning of the nerve fiber layer. Um, so what do we see, when do we use this? Well, we know now that um, there is no myelin. The myelin, which was a question that was raised before, is the protective sheath around the nerve fibers called the axons. Well, the myelin stops on the optic nerve the minute it inserts into the back of the eye. And so the retina, the retinal nerve fibers which form the optic nerve are not myelinated. And so what we know by looking at the OCT is that there is thinning of the nerve fiber layer. So it's not just a demyelinating disease, it's actually also an axonal disease. And we, that's known from the pathology of MS elsewhere in the body as well. Um, so now the question is, um, because this is the only place in the nervous system where we can directly observe the nerve, uh, the nerve itself, can we determine if loss of nerve tissue at that level implies whether there's disease progression, um, which may uh, necessitate uh, increase uh, or more aggressive treatment? This is not um, ready for prime time yet, but these are the things that were being studied. Um, and so, does it predict outcomes or course? And uh, after an episode of optic neuritis, we will see thinning of the nerve fiber layer in the vast majority of uh, patients. And if people have thinning of their nerve fiber layer, normal is about 100 to 110 microns. If we see it below 75 microns, um, that's often correlated with residual uh, disability. 75 microns or greater generally has an excellent uh, visual outcome. Uh, and the question is, uh, there's a variant, another demyelinating disease, neuromyelitis optica, more aggressive disease, affects spinal cord and the optic nerves uh, uh, predominantly. Um, we don't think we can necessarily differentiate between optic neuritis from NMO and optic neuritis from MS um, by OCT alone, but there certainly does tend to be uh, more thinning in the NMO patients than in the MS patients, but there is some overlap. But it can't really differentiate between who comes into your office with optic neuritis, um, who's going to go on to develop MS. MRI is the greatest predictor in that um, uh, arena. But a thinner nerve fiber layer may, it, it seems there it's a tend to have a thinner nerve fiber layer. And it may be because in people with chronic MS who've never had their optic nerves involved, we see thinning, progressive thinning of the nerve fiber layer. So maybe by the time someone gets to me with an episode of optic neuritis, they've already had their MS for a while. But before presenting to me, it may have been a radiographically isolated syndrome. Remember, a patient comes to me 
presents with optic neuritis. I get an MRI, there are 12 plaques on their MRI, there's three plaques on their MRI, there's two plaques, whatever. These plaques didn't start the day their optic neuritis started. These are the people who had they got an MRI for some other reason uh, a month before their episode of optic neuritis or a year before their optic neuritis would have had typical demyelinating plaques who never yet presented with symptoms. So, um, every, uh, so any of the people who already have abnormalities on their MRI at their presentation really had radiographic isolated disease. Prior to that, they just didn't know about it because they hadn't gotten their scan yet. But those of you who had, we find it. Um, so, um, and now this is what's being introduced in these trials. Can we use um, a short-term change in the nerve fiber layer? You start out at baseline, and I see you with an episode of optic neuritis, and your nerve fiber layer is uh, 100, let's say, and we give you drug A, B, or C, um, and now we measure your optic nerve thickness with OCT um, six months down the line. Can I then infer that if somebody has, if we had 100 people and the overall average thickness was greater in people treated with a certain drug or given a placebo or greater in people treated with drug A versus drug B, is that uh, drug now protective um, uh, to the uh, nervous system? So those are directions that we're going with. And uh, in conclusion, it's important, certainly far more importantly than a neuro-ophthalmologist, you need to be followed by a, neuro by a general neurologist or who really has great expertise in MS. All neurologists deal with MS to some degree, it's part of their practice, but there's some people who just, it's all they do, it's what they do best, and those are the people you want to be hooked up with. And certainly in terms of uh, visual uh, complaints, a neuro-ophthalmologist is best able to address what's related to MS or what's not. Not every, you know, you can have blurred vision from dry eye, you can have blurred vision because you're uh, 48 years old and you need reading glasses. I mean, there's so many things that aren't MS that might cause somebody with MS to question if it's the cause of their visual complaint or not. And uh, that's it. I'd be happy to open this up to uh, Well, thanks questions. first. Let's thank Dr. K first. Thank you. Which side of the room am I starting with? I saw a hand go up first. Is it possible that depth perception can be involved in this too when you have MS and why and what do you do for that? Yeah. Especially um, when driving. Sure. Uh, one thing that I didn't talk about, well, so first of all, well, one thing I did talk about but didn't mention depth perception in is if a person sees double, in order to really have great start, true stereo vision, the eyes have to be focused at the same place to give you that depth. Now, if you only have one eye, or if you're seeing double, because one eye's here and one eye's there, your eyes aren't lined up, you're going to have altered depth perception. You don't have no depth perception. I still know that you're further away from me than the woman in the purple shirt, because I see her superimposed on you, or you might be driving down the road and you see a big truck and a small truck and you can infer, well, that small truck must be further away than the big truck, um, so the big truck must be closer. So there's ways besides true stereo vision to have depth perception um, appreciated. But another thing that MS can do is um, by causing the demyelination of the optic nerves, it slows the transmission of the impulse of the outside world from where we're looking now, from where you're sitting, to the back of my brain. So, um, and when we do visual evoke potentials, which I don't do because clinically I have so many other ways to determine you have an optic neuropathy or you don't, but what the visual evoke potentials do for the neurologist who doesn't have all the tools at his disposal that I do in my office, um, they will show that it actually, there's a delay in the transmission, a latency from a stimulus being presented to it registers in the brain. Well, so then that's altering your depth perception because you're used to if something's right there, it's going to take a split second, you know, mic microseconds to get to you, and there can be a delay. So that can certainly alter the depth perception. Because we're going to have limited time, we're going to need a little bit shorter answers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and we're, going to, we're going to go with this person here because she's got to leave. Um, How are you doing? A lot of people that have MS, when they talk with me about eyesight problems and stuff, they, they keep telling me that they know or they bet that I have optic neuritis. And I said, I don't think so, because I think you told me I have optic atrophy, You right? have optic atrophy. Your nerves are pale like those I've shown there. They are. 
And that can be, so even in the absence of an acute episode of optic neuritis, um, you, just like you get atrophy elsewhere in the brain, the optic nerves can become atrophic over time. Okay, I know people, some of you may begin to wander out. I need to ask you all to fill out a seminar evaluation before you leave, okay? Hi, if, if you have multiple episodes of optical neuritis and you have um, treatments of the steroid Steroids. drip, yes. how come it'll work one time and not the others? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good question, and, and it's a true observation. Why? Can't tell you. Um, if you look at 100 people, the recovery after a second and a third episode can be as good as the first episode, but there are clearly people who do not get their vision back. There's people who only have a single episode and don't get their vision back um, after their first event and can have an episode affect their other eye that comes back fully, have an episode affect the same eye which gets back to their previous baseline, um, even though the first episode didn't, and there's other times where you got better your first two times and didn't get better the third. So the answer is yes, that can happen. But no, no reason for it. Anybody else? Yes, over here. Here. Hi, doctor. Yes, I have two questions. That's sure. Okay. First, if you have a stroke on the eye, you can recover from it when you don't have any vision? A stroke or optic neuritis? A stroke like from poor blood flow to the eye? Right. Because of the arterial or something like that? Very... Very uncommon. If you have like a, the equivalent of a TIA to the brain, a transient ischemic attack to the brain, and it only affects the eye for 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, you can get complete recovery. Any prolonged arterial uh, blood insufficiency to the eye for more than like 90 minutes, it would be extremely rare to recover. <laughs> Stroke to the brain, though, you might get a little more recovery depending uh, on... Uh, the, de the severity of it. Hi. Um, can double be vision be intermittent? <coughs> Meaning, not necessarily be f or last for days, but rather a uh, few minutes or a few hours and then go away? Um, you know, clearly I've had MS patients tell me that they've had double vision, which does come and go, and it's not this fixed deficit where my eye doesn't move in and it lasts for three or four weeks like any other exacerbation or a few months and get better. Um, and just the same way that I, you hear MS patients say I have facial numbness that lasts for 15 minutes, you think, well, gosh, an inflammatory event should be lasting for weeks. But in the much the same way that I know people get these transient sensory symptoms or motor symptoms where they feel fatigued, it seems that they're, pro I, I don't have good studies to cite on that other than people have complained of it, are quite aware of it, and so the answer is I guess it does. Yep. Over here, this person has a question. I have vision that is blurred and another day it's clear. Is that from MS or optic neuritis and will it ever go away? <laughs> you know, it's unclear what you mean by your vision's not clear or blurry. So, um, I, the best thing to do would be to see your ophthalmologist, uh, preferably on a day where you're having your blurry vision so that they can then address, is it correctable? Is it just your eye is dry? Is it that you've uh, got a mucus film? Or is it really that the optic nerve is not functioning? So I don't think I can quite answer that question the way it's uh, posed. I'd have to see it during the event. Just wondering if any stem cell research is being done in this department that you do. Yeah. Um, stem cell research is going on. Um, in terms of MS alone, I mean, Dr. Steingo could probably speak a lot more about that. In terms of visual problems, I have a patient who had a stroke um, with a hemianopia similar to what I showed there with uh, half the vision gone in each eye. He flew out to, uh, actually it was a a uh, company based out in San Diego, he had to actually fly over to Mexico where they transported the stem cells over the border for him to get his infusion. There's uh, some places uh, that have sites set up, uh, even in Florida, I think Stemgenics does now. Um, 
it's really just coming to the forefront. Dr. Steinger mentioned actually about the adipocyte stem cells. Um, and um, that's, I believe, what this group locally here is doing. Um, there's different ways to infuse them. There's mesenchymal stem cells are injecting intravenously. There's some that they want to put directly into the nervous system. So I think we're going to see a lot more on that, not in 10 years or 15 years, but in the next few years, because it's becoming uh, prime time and real. Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, Dr. K. If you see a neuro ophthalmologist and a cornea specialist, do you need a regular ophthalmologist? Um, maybe. So I don't do glasses. So and some neuro ophthalmologists do actually prescribe glasses. I just really don't. I I haven't prescribed a pair of glasses in over 20 years. Um, so if you're seeing a cor most cornea specialist do do general ophthalmology as well, because they're not just doing cornea, but they're doing um, cataracts and LASIK surgery. So in that case, probably not necessary. But if they say no, they don't do the annual dilated fundus exam, uh, you certainly might entertain it. But that would be a question for the cornea person. I do ask, by the way, that all my patients uh, see their general ophthalmologist on an annual basis. Yep. Um, I have a question about nystagmus. Yes. Uh, what causes that, and is myelin, or is it part of the ganglia, or okay. or is it both? <laughs> well, um, nystagmus is always intrinsic to either the brainstem or the cerebellum. Those are the two areas in the brain that will result in nystagmus when there's dysfunction. And that is white matter. That's usually a demyelinating event affecting the pathways in the brainstem or in the cerebellum. Yeah, so Ampira happens to have specific 3,4-aminopyridine or Ampira. Um, which uh, three, four aminopyridines, another preparation, a similar analog, um, has absolutely been shown to dampen a specific type of nystagmus, actually, and that's something called downbeat nystagmus, which is localized either to the cerebellum or the area where the base of the spinal cord, the medulla, joins the cervical spinal cord, so pathology in that region. So Empira has actually very specific indication for that one type of nystagmus, and I've had it be very helpful to patients. That's correct. Okay, doctor, uh, another question. Uh, where would you trace a line between, is an issue with the eye or is a mess? I ask that because I don't know sometimes this is a mess or I, every time I go to the ophthalmology they say 2020, but. Right, right, and, and that, that's a good point. There is so much, when you talk about you know, similar to what Dr. Steinger was talking about, the invisible symptoms of MS, well, there's a lot more to vision than are you 2020. What does 2020 mean? 2020 means how well do I read a tiny black target on a very bright white background? And that totally erases out, well, you could have half your field gone in each eye and still be 2020. You could have contrast sensitivity issues yet still be 2020. You can have depth perception issues in double vision and still be 2020, although the ophthalmologist would pick up on the double vision issue where they should. Um, so I think there's just so much more to vision than just 2020, and that's where sometimes stepping beyond and, uh, and maybe seeing a neuro ophthalmologist, somebody who's gonna dig a little deeper into it um, can help out. Yep. Oh. Okay. Um, can MS just cause your vision just to get worse? Just your vision, not optic neuritis, just generally get worse? Um, the answer is if you're one of those people what I call chronic or smoldering demyelination, so uh, the woman who left a, a short bit ago, um, she's an example since I know her who has uh, chronic 
atrophy of her uh, optic nerves in spite of the absence of an acute episode of optic neuritis at any time. So her vision can gradually deteriorate over time. We do get people who end up with 2200 vision in each eye from this gradual deterioration. But of course, there's so many other things that can make it worse. Cataracts as you get older, um, uh, retinal problems, uh, macular degeneration. So uh, yes, we can see it strictly as a result of optic nerve problems, or other, or problems elsewhere in the brain. And also something we didn't discuss is interpreting what you see. Sometimes it's the visual integration pathway. So vision's fine, the optic nerve looks fine, it's a healthy pink color, there's no clear deficit on the visual pathways, but sometimes there's just this disorder of visual integration where you can see fine, but you don't understand necessarily what you're seeing, you can't comprehend it. So there's uh, different things that can affect vision related to MS that don't affect the eye or the optic nerve itself. Last question right here. Yep. If a parent has macular degeneration, whether it be wet or dry, <laughs> is that something that's inherited or not at all? Yes, no, no, no. There is a higher incidence of uh, macular degeneration in family members who have it. It's not like one of those 50% uh, autosomal dominant transmissions, but, uh, but yes, uh, macular degeneration can travel in families tends to be more common in blue-eyed patients than brown-eyed patients, and blue eyes travel in families, so you know that, that alone puts it at increased risk. Just keep going to the yes, there's no prevention. So any of this stuff you hear on TV, Aki, I'm good, good question, because it has nothing to do with MS, but Occuvite or uh, the Preservision, et cetera, all the things you hear about on TV, these do not prevent you from developing macular degeneration. What it does do is it takes people who've got moderate macular degeneration from going on to the more severe types of either more severe dry or the wet form, but it doesn't prevent you from going from mild to moderate or from having no macular degeneration to preventing you. So let's thank Dr. Matt Kay for coming here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you know where we're up to, right? Again, I want to thank the company that gave us the funding to do today's program. That would be Genzyme, a Sanofi company. Genzyme is the maker of Abagio, which there are people in this room currently using. And like Dr. Steingo was speaking about, Lemtrada, they are hoping to get onto this market in the near future. So we do want to thank them again.